Hello friends, I welcome you to the continuation in this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight I shall be reading for you chapter 15 at Telegram, as well as chapter 16, Letters. And now, let's find that special place where you can comfortably relax. Let's unwind, settle down, and let's begin these chapters. Chapter 15 A Telegram November is the most disagreeable month in the whole year, said Margaret, standing at the window one dull afternoon, looking out at the frost bitten garden. That's the reason. I was born in it, observed Joe pensively, quite unconscious of the blot on her nose. If something very unpleasant should happen now, we should think it a delightful month, said Beth, who took a hopeful view of everything, even November. I dare say, but nothing pleasant ever does happen in this family, said Meg, who was out of sorts. We go grubbing along day after day, without a bit of change, and very little fun. We might as well be in a treadmill. My patience, how blue we are, cried Joe. I don't much wonder, poor dear, for you see other girls having splendid times, while you grind, grind year in and year out. Oh, don't I wish I could manage things for you as I do for my heroines. You're pretty enough and good enough already. So, I don't have some rich relation. Leave you a fortune unexpectedly. Then you dash out as an heiress, scorn everyone who has slighted you, go abroad, and come home my lady something in a blaze of splendor and elegance. People don't have fortunes left them in that style nowadays. Men have to work, and women marry for money. It's a dreadful, unjust world, said Meg bitterly. Joe and I are going to make fortunes for you all. Just wait ten years and see if we don't, said Amy, who sat in the corner making mud pies, as Hannah called her little clay models of birds fruit and faces. Can't wait, and I'm afraid I haven't much faith in ink and dirt, though I'm grateful for your good intentions, Meg sighed, and turned to the frostbitten garden again. Joe groaned, and leaned both elbows on the table in a despondent attitude, but Amy sped it away energetically, and Beth, who sat at the other window, sat smiling. Two pleasant things are going to happen right away. Marmy is coming down the street, and Laurie is tramping through the garden, as if he had something nice to tell. In they both came, Mrs. Marge with her usual question, any letter from father, girls? And Laurie to say in his persuasive way, Won't some of you come for a drive? I've been working away at mathematics till my head is in a muddle and I'm going to freshen my wits by a brisk turn. It's a dull day, but the air isn't bad, and I'm going to take Brooke home, so it will be gay inside if it isn't out. Come, Joe, you and Beth will go, won't you? Of course we will. Much obliged, but I'm busy. And Meg whisked out her work basket, for she had agreed with her mother that it was best for her, at least, not to drive too often with the young gentleman. We three will be ready in a minute, cried Amy, running away to wash her hands. Can I do anything for you, Madam Mother? asked Laurie, leaning over Mrs. March's chair with the affectionate look and tone he always gave her. No, thank you, except call at the office. If you'll be so kind, dear, it's our day for a letter, and the postman hasn't been. Father is as regular as the sun, 
but there's some delay on the way, perhaps. A sharp ring interrupted her, and a minute after, Hannah came in with a letter. It's one of them horrid telegram things, Mom, she said, handling it as if she was afraid it would explode and do some damage. At the word telegraph, Mrs. March snatched it, and read the two lines it contained, and dropped back into her chair as white as if the little paper had sent a bullet to her heart. Laurie dashed downstairs for water, while Meg and Hannah supported her, and Joe read aloud in a frightened voice. Mrs. March, colon, your husband is very ill, full stop. Come at once, full stop. As Hale, Lank Hospital, Washington, full stop. How still the room was as they listened breathlessly. How strangely the day darkened outside, and how suddenly the whole world seemed to change, as the girls gathered about their mother, feeling as if all the happiness and support of their lives was about to be taken from them. Mrs. March was herself again directly, read the message over, and stretched out her arms to her daughters, saying, in a tone they never forgot, I shall go at once, but it may be too late. O oh, children, children, help me to bear it. For several minutes there was nothing but the sound of sobbing in the room. Mingled with the broken words of comfort, tender assurances of help, and hopeful whispers that died away in tears. Poor Hannah was the first to recover, and with unconscious wisdom she set all the rest a good example. For with her, work was a panacea for most afflictions. The Lord keep the dear man. I won't waste no more time a-crying. But get your things ready right away, ma'am, she said heartily, as she wiped her face on her apron, gave her mistress a warm shake of the hand with her own hard one, and went away to work like three women in one. She's right. There's no time for tears now. Be calm, girls, and let me think. They tried to be calm, poor things, as their mother sat up, looking pale but steady, and put away her grief to think a plan for them. Where's Laurie? she asked presently, when she had collected her thoughts and decided on the first duties to be done. Here, ma'am. Oh, let me do something, cried the boy hurrying from the next room whither he had withdrawn, feeling that their first sorrow was too sacred for even his friendly eyes to see. Send a telegram saying I will come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. What else? The horses are ready. I can go anywhere, do anything, he said, looking ready to fly to the ends of the earth. Leave a note at Aunt March's. Joe, give me that pen and paper. Tearing off the blank side of one of her newly copied pages, Joe drew the table before her mother, well knowing that money for the long, sad journey must be bought, and feeling as if she could do anything to add a little to the sum for her father. Now go, dear, but don't kill yourself driving at a desperate pace. There is no need of that. Mrs. March's warning was evidently thrown away, for five minutes later Laurie tore by the window on his own fleet horse, riding as if for his life. Joe, run to the rooms, and tell Mrs. King that I can't come. On the way, get these things. I'll put them down. They'll be needed, and I must go prepared for nursing. Hospital stores are not always good. Beth, go and ask Mr. Lawrence for a couple of bottles of old wine. I am not too proud to beg for father. He shall have the best of everything. Amy, tell Hannah to get down the black trunk, and Meg, come and help me find my things. For I am half bewildered. 
Writing, thinking, and directing all at once might well bewilder the poor lady. And Meg begged her to sit quietly in her room for a little while and let them work. Everyone scattered like leaves before a gust of wind, and the quiet, happy household was broken up as suddenly as if the paper had been an evil spell. Mr. Lawrence came hurrying back with Beth, bringing every comfort the kind old gentleman could think of. For the invalid, and friendliest promises of protection for the girls during the mother's absence, which comforted her very much. There was nothing he didn't offer, from his own dressing gown to himself as escort. But the last was impossible. Mrs. Marge would not hear of the old gentleman undertaking the long journey. Yet an expression of relief was visible when he spoke of it. For anxiety ill fits one for travelling. He saw the look, knit his heavy eyebrows, rubbed his hands, and marched abruptly away, saying he'd be back directly. No one had time to think of him again till, as Meg ran through the entry, with a pair of rubbers in one hand and a cup of tea in the other, she came suddenly upon Mr. Brock. I'm very sorry to hear of this, Miss March, he said in the kind, quiet tone which sounded very pleasantly to her perturbed spirit. I came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Mr. Lawrence has commissioned for me in Washington, and it will give me real satisfaction to be of service to her there. Down dropped the rubbers, and the tea was very nearly following, as Meg put out her hand with a face so full of gratitude that Mr. Brook would have felt repaid for a much greater sacrifice than the trifling one of time and comfort which he was about to take. How kind you are! Mother will accept, I'm sure, and it will be such a relief to know that she has someone to take care of her. Thank you very much, very much. Meg spoke earnestly and forgot herself entirely till something in the brown eyes looking down at her made her remember the cooling tea and led the way into the parlor, saying she would call her mother. Everything was arranged. By the time, Laurie returned with a note from Aunt March, enclosing the desired sum, and a few lines repeating what she had often said before, that she had always told them it was absurd for March to go into the army, always predicted that no good would come of it, and she hoped they would take her advice the next time. Mrs. March put the note in the fire the money in her purse, and went on with her preparations, with her lips folded tightly in a way which Jo would have understood if she had been there. The short afternoon wore away. All other errands were done, and Meg and her mother busy at some necessary needlework, while Beth and Amy got tea, and Hannah finished her ironing with what she called a slap and a bang. But still, Joe did not come. They began to get anxious, and Laurie went off to find her, for no one knew what freak Joe might take into her head. He missed her, however, and she came walking in with a very queer expression of countenance, for there was a mixture of fun and fear, satisfaction and regret in it, which puzzled the family as much as did the roll of bills she laid before her mother saying with a little choke in her voice, That's my contribution toward making father comfortable and bringing him home. My dear, where did you get it? Twenty-five dollars. Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it. And I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. As she spoke, Joe took off her bonnet, and a general outcry arose, for all her abundant hair was cut short.
your hair, your beautiful hair. Oh, Joe, how could you? You're one beauty. My dear girl, there was no need of this. She doesn't look like my Joe anymore, but I love her dearly for it. As everyone exclaimed, and Beth hugged the cropped head tenderly, Joe assumed an indifferent air, which did not deceive anyone a particle, and said, crumpling up the brown bush and trying to look as if she liked it, It doesn't affect the fate of the nation, so don't wail, Beth. It will be good for my vanity. I was getting too proud of my wig. It will do my brains good to have that mop taken off. My head feels deliciously light and cool. And the barber said I could soon have a curly crop, which will be boyish, becoming, and easy to keep in order. I'm satisfied, so please take the money and let's have supper. Tell me all about it, Joe. I am not quite satisfied, but I can't blame you, for I know how willingly you sacrificed your vanity, as you call it, to your love. But, my dear, it was not necessary, and I am afraid you will regret it one of these days, said Mrs. March. No, I won't, returned Joe stoutly, feeling much relieved that her prank was not entirely condemned. What made you do it? asked Amy, who would as soon have thought of cutting off her head as her pretty hair. Well, I was wild to do something for father, replied Joe, as they gathered about the table, for healthy young people can eat even in the midst of trouble. I hate to borrow as much as mother does, and I knew Aunt March would croak. She always does, if you ask for a ninepence. Meg gave all her quarterly salary to the rent, and I only got some clothes with mine, so I felt wicked, and was bound to have some money, if I sold the nose off my face to get it. You needn't feel wicked, my child. You had no winter things and got the simplest with your own hard earnings, said Mrs. March with a look that warmed Joe's heart. I hadn't the least idea of selling my hair at first, but as I went along I kept thinking what I could do, and feeling as if I'd like to dive into some of the rich stores and help myself. In a barber's window I saw tails of hair, with the prices marked, and one black tail, not so thick as mine, was forty dollars. It came to me all of a sudden that I had one thing to make money out of. And, without stopping to think, I walked in, asked if they bought hair, and what they would give for mine. I don't see how you dared to do it, said Beth in a tone of awe. Oh, he was a little man, who looked as if he merely lived to oil his hair. He rather stared at first, as if he wasn't used to having girls bounce into his shop and ask him to buy their hair. He said he didn't care about mine, it wasn't the fashionable color, and he never paid much for it in the first place. The work put into it made it dear, and so on. It was getting late, and I was afraid, if it wasn't done right away, that I shouldn't have done it at all. And you know, when I start to do a thing, I hate to give it up. So I begged him to take it, and I told him why I was in such a hurry. I was silly, I dare say, but it changed his mind, for I got rather excited, and told the story in my topsy-turvy way, and his wife heard, and said so kindly, Take it, Thomas, and oblige the young lady. I'd do as much for our Jimmy any day, if I had a spire of hair worth selling. Who was Jimmy? asked Amy, who liked to have things explained as they went along. Her son, she said, who was in the army. How friendly such things make strangers feel, don't they? She talked away all the time. The man clipped and diverted my mind nicely. Didn't you feel dreadfully when the first cut came? asked Meg with a shiver. I took a last look at my hair while the man got his things, 
and that was the end of it. I never sniffed over trifles like that. I will confess, though, I felt queer when I saw the dear old hair laid out on the table, and felt only the short rough ends of my head. It almost seemed as if I'd an arm or leg off. The woman saw me look at it, and picked out a long lock for me to keep. I'll give it to you, Mommy, just to remember past glories by, for a crop is so comfortable. I don't think I shall ever have a mane again. Mrs. March folded the wavy chestnut lock and laid it away with a short grey one in her desk. She only said, Thank you, dearie, but something in her face made the girls change the subject and talk as cheerfully as they could about Mr. Brooks' kindness. The prospect of a fine day tomorrow and the happy times they would have when father came home to be nursed. No one wanted to go to bed, when at ten o'clock Mrs. Marge put by the last finished job, and said, Come, girls. Beth went to the piano and played the father's favorite hymn. All began bravely, but broke down one by one, till Beth was left alone, singing with all her heart, for the music was always a sweet consoler. Go to bed and don't talk, for we must be up early and shall need all the sleep we can get. Good night, my darlings, said Mrs. March as the hymn ended, for no one cared to try another. They kissed her quietly and went to bed as silently as if the dear invalid lay in the next room. Beth and Amy soon fell asleep in spite of the great trouble, but Meg lay awake, thinking the most serious thoughts she had ever known in her short life. Joe lay motionless, and her sister fancied that she was asleep, till a stifled sob made her exclaim as she touched a wet cheek. Joe, dear, what is it? Are you crying about father? No, not now. What then? My, my hair, burst out poor Joe, trying vainly to smother her emotion in the pillow. It did not seem at all comical to Meg, who kissed and caressed the afflicted heroine in the tenderest manner. I'm not sorry, protested Joe with a choke. I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. It's only the vain part of me that goes and cries in this silly way. Don't tell anyone it's all over now. I thought you were asleep, so I just made a little private moan for my one beauty. How came you to be awake? I can't sleep. I'm so anxious, said Meg. Think about something pleasant and you'll soon drop off. I tried it, but felt wider awake than ever. What did you think of? Handsome faces, eyes particularly, answered Meg, smiling to herself in the dark. What color do you like the best? Brown. That is, sometimes, blue or lovely. Joe laughed, and Meg sharply ordered her not to talk, then amiably promised to make her hair curl, and fell asleep to dream of living in her castle in the air. The clocks were striking midnight, and the rooms were very still, as a figure glided quietly from bed to bed, smoothing a coverlet here, settling a pillow there, and pausing to look long and tenderly at each unconscious face, to kiss each with lips that mutely blessed, and to pray the fervent prayers which only mothers utter. As she lifted the curtain to look out into the dreary night, the moon broke suddenly from behind the clouds, and shone upon her like a bright, benignant face, which seemed to whisper in the silence, Be comforted, dear soul, there is always light behind the clouds. Chapter 16 Letters 
In the cold grey dawn, the sisters lit their lamp and read the chapter with an earnestness never felt before. For now, the shadow of a real trouble had come. The little books were full of help and comfort, and as they dressed, they agreed to say goodbye cheerfully and hopefully, and sent their mother on her anxious journey, unsaddened by tears or complaints from them. Everything seemed very strange when they went down, so dim and still outside, so full of light and bustle within. Breakfast at that early hour seemed odd, and even Hannah's familiar face looked unnatural as she flew about her kitchen, with her nightcap on. The big trunk stood ready in the hall, mother's cloak and bonnet lay on the sofa, and mother herself sat trying to eat but looking so pale and worn with sleeplessness and anxiety, that the girls found it very hard to keep their resolution. Meg's eyes kept filling in spite of her, and Jo was obliged to hide her face in the kitchen roller more than once, and the little girls wore a grave, troubled expression, as if sorrow was a new experience to them. Nobody talked much. But as the time drew very near, and they sat waiting for the carriage, Mrs. Marge said to the girls, who were all busied about her, one folding her shawl, another smoothing out the strings of her bonnet, a third putting on her overshoes, and a fourth fastening up her travel bag. Children, I have you to Hannah's care, and Mr. Lawrence's protection. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own. I have no fears for you, yet I am anxious that you should take this trouble rightly. Don't grieve and fret when I am gone, or think that you can be idle and comfort yourselves by being idle and trying to forget. Go on with your work as usual, for work is a blessed solace. Hope and keep busy and whatever happens, remember that you never can be fatherless. Yes, mother. Meg, dear, be prudent, watch over your sisters, consult Hannah, and in any perplexity go to Mr. Lawrence. Be patient, Joe, don't get despondent or do rash things. Write to me often and be my brave girl, ready to help and cheer all. Beth, Comfort yourself with your music, and be faithful to the little home duties. And you, Amy, help all you can, be obedient, and keep happy, safe at home. We will, mother, we will. The rattle of an approaching carriage made them all start and listen. That was the hard minute, but the girls stood it well. No one cried, and no one ran away and uttered a lamentation though their hearts were very heavy as they sent loving messages to father, remembering, as they spoke, that it might be too late to deliver them. They kissed their mother quietly, clung about her tenderly, and tried to wave their hands cheerfully when she drove away. Laurie and his grandfather came over to see her off, and Mr. Brook looked so strong and sensible and kind that the girls christened him Mr. Greatheart on the spot. Goodbye, my darlings. God bless and keep us all, whispered Mrs. March, as she kissed one dear little face after the other, and hurried into the carriage. As she rolled away, the sun came out, and looking back, she saw it shining on the group at the gate like a good omen. They saw it also, and smiled and waved their hands. And the last thing she beheld, as she turned the corner, was the four bright faces, and behind them, like a bodyguard, old Mr. Lawrence, faithful Hannah, and devoted Glory. How kind everyone is to us, she said, turning to find fresh proof of it in the respectful sympathy of the young man's face. I don't see how they can help it, returned Mr. Brooke, laughing so infectiously that Mrs. Marge could not help smiling, 
And so the journey began with the good omens of sunshine, smiles and cheerful words. I feel as if there had been an earthquake, said Joe, as their neighbors went home to breakfast, leaving them to rest and refresh themselves. It seems as if half the house was gone, added Meg forlornly. Beth opened her lips to say something, but could only point to the pile of nicely mended holes which lay on Mother's table, showing that even in her last hurried moments she had thought and worked for them. It was a little thing, but it went straight to their hearts, and in spite of the brave resolutions, they all broke down and cried bitterly. Hannah wisely allowed them to relieve their feelings, and when the shower showed signs of clearing up, she came to the rescue, armed with a coffee pot. Now, my dear young ladies, remember what your ma said, and don't fret. Come and have a cup of coffee all round. And then, let's fall to work and be a credit to the family. Coffee was a treat, and Hannah showed great tact in making it that morning. No one could resist her persuasive nods, or the frequent invitation issuing from the nose of the coffee pot. They drew up to the table, exchanged their handkerchiefs for napkins, and in ten minutes were all right again. Hope and keep busy, that's the motto for us. So let's see who will remember it best. I shall go to Aunt March as usual. Oh, won't she lecture, though, said Joe, as she sipped with returning spirit. I shall go to my king's, though I'd much rather stay at home and attend to things here, said Meg wishing she hadn't made her eyes so red. No need of that. Beth and I can keep house perfectly well, put in Amy with an important air. Hannah will tell us what to do, and we'll have everything nice when you come home, added Beth, getting out her mop and dish tub without delay. I think anxiety is very interesting, observed Amy, eating sugar pensively. The girls couldn't help laughing and felt better for it, though Meg shook her head at the young lady who could find consolation in a sugar bowl. The sight of the turnovers made Joe sober again, and when the two went out to the daily tasks, they looked sorrowfully back at the window, where they were accustomed to see their mother's face. It was gone, but Beth had remembered the little household ceremony and there she was, nodding away at them like a rosy-faced mandarin. That's so like my Beth, said Joe, waving her hat with a grateful face. Goodbye, Maggie. I hope the kings won't strain today. Don't fret about father, dear, she added as they parted. And I hope Aunt Marge won't croak. Your hair is becoming, and it looks very boyish and nice, returned Meg trying not to smile at the curly head, which looked comically small on her tall sister's shoulders. That's my only comfort. And, touching her head, a la Lori, away went Joe, feeling like a shorn sheep on a wintry day. News from their father comforted the girls very much, for, though dangerously ill, the presence of the best and tenderest of nurses had already done him good. Mr. Brooke sent a bulletin every day, and as the head of the family, Meg insisted on reading the dispatches, which grew more cheerful as the week passed. At first, everyone was eager to write, and plump envelopes were carefully poked into the letterbox by one or other of the sisters, who felt rather important with their Washington correspondence, as one of these packets contained characteristic notes from the party we will rob an imaginary mail and read them. My dearest mother, it is impossible to tell you how happy your last letter made us, for the news was so good we couldn't help laughing and crying over it. How very kind Mr. Brooke is, and how fortunate that Mr. Lawrence's business detains him near you so long, since he is so useful to you and father. The girls are all as good as gold, 
Joe helps me with the sewing and insists on doing all sorts of hard jobs. I should be afraid she might overdo if I didn't know her moral fit wouldn't last long. Beth is as regular about her task as a clock and never forgets what you told her. She grieves about father and looks sober except when she is at her little piano. Amy minds me nicely, and I take great care of her. She does her own hair, and I am teaching her to make buttonholes and mend her stockings. She tries very hard, and I know you will be pleased with her improvement when you come. Mr. Lawrence watches over us like a motherly old hen, as Joe says, and Laurie is very kind and neighborly. He and Joe keep us merry, for we get pretty blue sometimes, and feel like orphans with you so far away. Hannah is a perfect saint. She does not scold at all, and always calls me Miss Margaret, which is quite proper, you know, and treats me with respect. We are all well and busy, but we long, day and night, to have you back. Give my dearest love to Father, and believe me, ever your own, Meg. In this note, prettily written on scented paper, was a great contrast to the next, which was scribbled on a big sheet of thin foreign paper, ornamented with blots and all manner of flourishes and curly-tailed letters. My precious mommy, three cheers for dear father. Brooke was a trump to the telegraph right off, and let us know the minute he was better. I rushed up Garrett when the letter came, and tried to thank God for being so good to us, but I could only cry and say, I'm glad, I'm glad. Didn't that do as well as a regular prayer? For I felt a great many in my heart. We have such funny times, and now I can enjoy them. For everyone is so desperately good. It's like living in a nest of turtle doves. You'd laugh to see Meg head the table and try to be motherish. She gets prettier every day, and I'm in love with her sometimes. The children are regular archangels. And I, well, I'm Joe, and never shall be anything else. Oh, I must tell you that I came near having a quarrel with Laurie. I freed my mind about a silly little thing, and he was offended. I was right, but didn't speak as I ought and he marched home, saying he wouldn't come again till I begged pardon. I declared I wouldn't, and got mad. It lasted all day. I felt bad and wanted you very much. Laurie and I are both so proud. It's hard to beg pardon, but I thought he'd come to it, for I was in the right. He didn't come, and just at night I remembered what you said, when Amy fell into the river, I read my little book. Felt better, resolved not to let the sun set on my anger, and ran over to tell Laurie I was sorry. I met him at the gate, coming for the same thing. We both laughed, begged each other's pardon, and felt all good and comfortable again. I made a poem yesterday when I was helping Hannah wash as father likes my silly little things. I put it in to amuse him, give him my loveliest hug that ever was, and kiss yourself a dozen times for your topsy-turvy Joe. A song from the suds. Queen of my tub, I merrily sing, while the white foam rises high, and sturdily wash and rinse and wring, and fasten the clothes to dry. Then, out in the free fresh air they swing, under the sunny sky. I wish we could wash from our hearts and soul the stains of the week away, and let water and air by their magic make ourselves as pure as they. Then on the earth there would be indeed a glorious washing day. Along the path of a useful light, will heart's ease ever bloom? The busy mind has no time to think, of sorrow or care or bloom. And anxious thoughts may be swept away as we bravely wield a broom. I am glad the task to me is given to labor at day by day. 
for it brings me health and strength and hope, and I cheerfully learn to say. Head you may think, heart you may feel, but hand you shall work alway. Dear Mother, There is only room for me to send my love, and some pressed pansies from the root I have been keeping safe in the house for Father to see. I read every morning, try to be good all day, and sing myself to sleep with Father's tune. I can't sing, Land of the Lean now, it makes me cry. Everyone is very kind, and we are as happy as we can be without you. Amy wants the rest of the page, so I must stop. I didn't forget to cover the holders, and I wind the clock and air the rooms every day. Kiss dear father on the cheek he calls mine. Oh, do come soon to your loving little Beth. Ma chère mamma, we are all well. I do my lessons always and never corroborate the girls. Meg says I mean contradict, so I put in both words. And you can take the properest. Meg is a great comfort to me and lets me have jelly every night at tea. It's so good for me, Joe says, because it keeps me sweet-tempered. Laurie is not as respectful as he ought to be now I am almost in my teens. He calls me chick and hurts my feelings by talking French to me very fast, and I say merci or bonjour, as Hattie King does. The sleeves of my blue dress were all worn out, and Meg put in new ones. But the full front came wrong, and they are more blue than the dress. I felt bad, but did not fret, I bear my troubles well. But I do wish Hannah would put more starch in my aprons, and have buckwheats every day. Can't she? Didn't I make the interrogation point nice? Meg says my punctuation and spelling are disgraceful. And I am mortified, but dear me, I have so many things to do, I can't stop. Adieu, I send heaps of love to Papa, your affectionate daughter, Amy Curtis March. Dear Miss March, I just dropped a line to say, we get on fuss red. The girls is clever and fly round right smart. Miss Meg is going to make a proper good housekeeper. She has the liking for it, and gets the hang of things surprising quick. Joe do speed all for going ahead, but she don't stop to calculate first, and you never know where she's like to bring up. She done out a tub of clothes on Monday, but she starch him a four day was wrenched, and blew the pink calico dress till I thought I should have died a laughing. Beth is the best of the little creatures and a side of help to me, being so forehanded and dependable. She tries to learn everything, and really goes to market beyond her years. Likewise keeps accounts, with my help. Quite wonderful. We have got on very economical so far. I don't let the girls have coffee only once a week, according to your wish, and keep them on plain wholesome vittles. Amy does well without fretting. Wearing her best clothes and eating sweet stuff. Mr. Lorry is as full of dittos as usual and turns the house upside down frequent. But he heartens the girls, so I let him have full swing. The old gentleman sends heaps of things and is rather wearing, but means well. And it ain't my place to say nothing. My bread is riz, so no more at this time. I sent my duty to Mr. March and hope he's seen the last of his pneumonia. Yours respectful, Hannah Mollett. Head nurse of Ward No. 2. All serene on the Rappahannock. Troops in fine condition. Commissary department well conducted. The home guard under Colonel Teddy always on duty. Commander-in-chief General Lawrence reviews the army daily. Quartermaster Mollett keeps order in camp. And Major Lyon does picket duty at night. A salute of twenty-four guns was fired on receipt of good news from Washington, and a dress parade took place at headquarters. Commander-in-Chief sends best wishes, in which he is heartily joined by Colonel Teddy. Dear Madam, 
The little girls are all well. Beth and my boy report daily. Hannah is a model servant, and guards pretty Meg like a dragon. Glad to find weather holds. Pray make Brooke useful, and draw on me for funds if expenses exceed your estimate. Don't let your husband want anything. Thank God he is mending. Your sincere friend and servant, James Lawrence.